1987's Evil Dead 2 review and thoughts. So, welcome back to Spooktober. And, yeah, I should probably have done the following last time, but here we go. Longtime fans of the channel already know I love horror classics and have done numerous videos on entire franchises of them. Did Halloween, did Friday the 13th, did A Nightmare on Elm Street, you know, so yeah, really glad to be doing another one of those. It has been a minute. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes, none at the expense of members of minorities, and I will get into some serious topics. Not that many, though. And, yeah, if you're looking for a review that's like, oh, well, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by little movies, because of that, it's not that much fun to watch today. Whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. And... Uh, yeah, so the top link in the description box will enable you to donate to the SAG After Strikers, and I implore you to do so. And then there are some links to videos to help explain why this is such an important strike. So, time to rev up the chainsaw, let's get into the movie. So, I, yeah, realize this video is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. And I start the video with a review where I'm probably not going to spoil anything. If I do decide over the course of the video that I'm going to spoil something, I'll verbally warn before I do so, hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler, so you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. I will not be warning before spoilers for the first movie, and as soon as I end the review itself, the rest of the movie will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. So, this movie is rated R for the, let's see, yeah, uh, severe violence and gore, moderate profanity, moderate frightening and intense scenes, no alcohol, drugs, and smoking, and mild sex and nudity, and yeah, this is, like the first one, this is very much a movie that, if you think this movie is too gory for you, then yes, it absolutely is. If there's any question that you're, you're like, yeah, you know, I'm, I thought I was okay with gore, but then there was that thing that was a little bit too much. This movie's too much for you, plain and simple. There's absolutely no doubt, doubt about it. It was made to push buttons and is all the better for it. And, yeah, um, I don't know how many times I have watched this. Uh, for a long time, I didn't have access to it. Overall, maybe half a dozen and yeah so the the plot you know some yeah once again a few young people go to a small cabin in the woods only to have to deal with terrifying evil spirits possessing and tormenting you know yeah possess, possessing at least some of them and tormenting all of them and that yes so this, once again, was written and directed by Sam Raimi. This one was also written by Scott Spiegel, who also... Uh, let's see... He's got some... Yeah, they had worked together on some of the... Yeah. They, they made It's Murder together, and the... Yeah. You know, he's, he's credited as a writer on the collection that IMDb calls Sam Raimi Early Shorts. And, yeah, they very much, they, they get... Yeah, they're, they're really great together at, you know, getting really solid material. And, uh, yeah, so ranked worst to best and I'm at the end of the review itself I'll update with the ranking of the this particular movie but yeah I love all all five Evil Dead movies and the ranking starts with the first one goes to Army of Darkness then the remake and Rise and as I said when I talk about the first movie, I do really love the first movie. The fact that it's at the bottom doesn't mean that I don't think it's an amazing movie. Something has to be at the bottom. That is the nature of a ranking. 
and yeah, like the first one, you know, just full of the 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 gore and the the you know stuff is being gross stuff is being shot at faces and particular Bruce Campbell's you know there's there's a lot of creativity they they you know the old school filmmaking and practical effects really make it what it is and yeah sometimes it's scary sometimes it's funny sometimes it's both of them and yeah Hitchcock is a very clear influence you know everything there's there's set up and payoff for for everything in the movie nothing just comes completely out of the blue. There's a couple of things that have more payoffs than you might think. And I'm, I'm not going to be going into which in the review itself, but just there's, yeah, more than one thing in this will have multiple payoffs, and it's just, it's fantastic. Like, it's the kind of thing where, like, a half-hearted horror movie will have something pop up and it's like, oh, it's, okay, I, I guess I had to do a thing there. It doesn't really make sense with the rest of the movie, but whatever. But here, that thing that just pops up was set up earlier. And, let's see. Yeah, and, you know, the, the, let's see. Yeah, there, there are dozens and dozens of camera tricks, types of special effects, you know, it's not that they invented all of these for this particular movie. A you number know, that had had been seen before certainly used tricks that had been that had been seen before. You know, they they multiple times use the the age old special effects trick of simply reversing the film to make something have an unnatural effect or something seem to. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want I don't want to spoil anything, but just it moves in a way that you're like that's impossible. It couldn't possibly work. It will be moving like that. And the simple truth is, you know, they had it move normally and reverse the film and it's like it's it's the easiest thing. It's it is 101, it's baby steps, but it works really well and yeah, Sam Raimi, you know, even after this continued to use these old school effects and yeah, really, really love to see it, you know. Let's see, and... Yeah, you know, it's it's basically the reboot your computer version. You know, if, if you're having any kind of computer problem, start by rebooting, you know. The very first thing you'll want to do if you're struggling with a special effect or a computer, and a bunch of these things had been in other movies. It was rare for any one movie to do this many. And, yeah, so the the ranking of all the Sam Raimi movies that I have watched, this is, again, worst to best, uh, Spider-Man 3, and honestly, the, the rest of these I love, Drag Me to Hell, Oz, The Quick and the Dead, The Gift, Spider-Man 1, Spider-Man 2, uh, let's see, Evil Dead 1, Doctor Strange 2, Evil Dead 3, A Simple Plan, and Dark Man 1. Dark Man 1 remains my absolute favorite. I think that is the one where he really, the, the very best job he's ever done of just taking completely different, dis seemingly disparate elements from classics that he loves. Not not all of them films, but yeah, you know, films that are, that are you know, practically ancient, you know, you feel like you have to blow the dust off before you put the DVD in. And yeah, he just absolutely nails it. It's, it's, completely bonkers it should not work it has no right to be as good as it is i love it now some people do not love that this movie evil dead 2 is so similar to the first evil dead in defense of sam raimi he intended the movie to be completely different in fact the third movie was supposed to be the second movie but he couldn't raise the funds so he made the second one like a bigger budget version of the first one and yeah, like anything that is at least partially inspired by H.P. Lovecraft and demonizes non-Christian belief systems, this is unfortunately somewhat racist. And honestly, it could have been about Christianity, since that one features one of the most famous zombies in Jesus. But I can appreciate that the movie didn't want to enrage the Christians, who, let's be honest, look for any excuse to be offended about their religion and its depiction in media, as if there are not countless pieces of media that have positive, even propagandistic depiction of it. 
But the reason for there being supernatural evil didn't need to be, well, supernatural. It could easily have been somewhat, though well, fairly dubious, science like the original Night of the Living Dead movie, a movie that the first Evil Dead movie does take inspiration from in other respects. This movie, compared to the first one, has greater variety to the characters. Not all of them are a bunch of college students who know each other at the start. This one also features a redneck, a hick... A redneck, his hit girlfriend, the professor and Marianne, I mean, a professor, not the one who discovered the Sumerian text, but his daughter, Anne, and her boyfriend. And, yeah, so in this one, Bruce Campbell as Ash gets increasingly animated, cartoonish, and ridiculous. You know, they saw that the audience really responded to it, even in the first movie, where it was to a much lesser extent, though it was there, and... The more broad his character gets, the more, you know, yeah, the more fun the audience has watching him, and he has playing the character. It's very, very clear that he's absolutely loving, like, literally throwing himself into this. Not only is this movie one of the most scary, most gory, most funny movies ever made, it's just also plain one of the most movies ever made, period. In the first one, the overtop performance that we love, uh, let's see, yeah, usually other than Bruce Campbell, the actors playing Deadites. In this one, we get some great OTT performances by other human characters as well, in addition to Campbell's being glorious here. Honestly, I don't know any other director who directs supporting characters and extras quite like Sam Raimi. I mean, some, you know, there are other directors who get those kind of memorable OTT performances out of the leads. But here, you know, with Sam Raimi, it's not only the leads. Seriously, hit me up in the comments if you know another director where so many of the performances are so ridiculous. Just, yeah. And, yeah, this movie opens with a recap of the first and then basically acts as a what happened after the end of Evil Dead 1. Whether you want to call that a remake or a sequel, you know, I, I don't think we need to, to be discussing it. I, let's just pour all the love we feel over the movies instead of obsessing over details like that. I really don't think that you have to choose one of the two to watch or love. The movie absolutely does feel like, yeah, Raimi would have loved to be able to make this when making the first film. And yeah, this is the rare sequel to top its predecessor. And yeah, in some aspects, it is much bigger than the first one. You know, there's one shot with more geysers of blood spraying in just that one shot than the entire first movie combined. They literally use the fire hose on more than one occasion. One scene has a plane land, though, of course, they, you know, to cost cut, they just have it drive into shot. They didn't actually film a plane landing. A bunch of extras get off. That costs money, you know. There's more extras in this film, in that one scene, than characters in the entire first movie. You know, if you count everyone you see in here, there's more people on the plane. You know, so, yeah. And you could, you know, you could, you could forgive Sam Raimi for you know, just showing off just, like, what's the, th you know, just showing off that he has more money now, but he really doesn't. It's, it all serves, you know, the, the fact that we see the plane land helps explain, you know, they, they just got, you know, the next time we see them, they get out of a car. If that was the first time we saw them, we'd be like, they didn't, they didn't actually drive all that way, did they? And, you know, but but yeah, and it also just it tell it helps convey to the audience this is bigger, you know. This is, yeah, you know. At the very start, the movie doesn't look as big as it gets. It it is clear from pretty much right away that it is bigger though, and with more people in the cabin, there's even more flexibility for scenes of evil spirit fueled mayhem, and they really get creative with it. You never know exactly what's going to happen, or even to who. Who is going to get possessed? Who's going to get attacked? With what? By whom? You know, and and just, yeah, throughout, like, it never loses the energy. It's it's constantly, you know, it, it feels like 
a movie made by 13 year old boys who are like, ooh, and then what if, yeah, and then that, just, ooh, oh, you know what should happen? Then it's just, you know, and, and it's just, it's, the energy is infectious. You know, you can't, you know, I am aware that there are some people who apparently don't love this movie, and that's fine. I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, but I, I just, I don't know how it's possible. You know, it's just, it's such an amazing, just, yeah. And this is where we really start getting Three Stooges gags recreated with a horror sensibility. And yeah, it's just, it's amazing. And in some ways, it is just as gonzo as the original, but the effects are better, and it is overall more polished and professional. And let's see. Yeah, that brings us to the cast. So, there we go. So yeah, Bruce Campbell returns as Ash Williams, and this and Army of Darkness are especially where the character really took off and really left a you know significant mark on pop culture and yeah Sarah Barry plays Annie Noby daughter of Professor Noby from the f yeah the first one who unwittingly summons the demons Dan Hicks his name actually is Hicks plays Jake the the Hick Cassie Wesley plays Bobby Joe his girlfriend Denise Bixler plays Linda in the the recap and uh, yeah and and also yeah um, yeah uh, Richard Domeyer plays Professor Ed Getley who is with Annie and John Peaks plays Professor Noby this time around Lou Hancock plays Henrietta Noby his wife and William Preston Robertson played, you know, yeah, gives us the voice of the Evil Dead, and yeah, like everyone is game. No one feels like, oh, it's a paycheck, whatever. You know, gotta keep the lights running. It really feels like everyone, you know, their characters may not want to be in this cabin, but the actors absolutely just, yeah, n no one's. No one is bored, no one, which, you know, don't know if I want to name names, but that was a thing with some 80s horror movies. It was like, okay, that actor really did it. You know, you can, you can see, you watch the actor perform, and you can see them, like, men, you know, making a mental note, do not put this on my resume, this was a mistake, you know, and it's just, the movie's less fun for it, and never, just never happens here, like, there's constant, you know, energy, and, you know, reportedly, you know, Bruce Campbell has said that after one take, you know, Sam Raimi said that is the worst reverse acting I have ever seen, and I'm happy to report you know, whatever exactly happened in that take did, apparently didn't make it into the movie because there is no bad... It just... Let me rephrase that. It's not that there's no bad acting. It's that it's intentionally bad. It's intentionally ridiculous. And, you know, for a while, there was perhaps a perception of Sam Raimi that he couldn't really direct a subtle performance, which he then did completely disprove. I forget about The Quick and the Dead, the, the, but certainly in a simple plan from, I want to say, 1998. You know, 100% really, really subtle performances. You know, it's, I believe one of them, was it um, Billy Bob Thornton, I think, won an Oscar for it, you know, so... But, but yeah, at this point in his career, this was very much what he wanted to do. And, yeah, so it was, you know, some of it was filmed in the Dino de Laurentiis Studios in North Carolina. And, uh, yeah, there's also some location shooting in North Carolina and Michigan. 
and they they get some really great use out of it the yeah it just it the fact that some of this was actually shot in the woods and in this cabin in the woods really change you know it there's a there's a real sense of place you you feel like you know you you could practically direct a tour of the yeah this place after watching the movie and yeah so the music is yet again really really solid just yeah and the the sound design there are certain things in this movie that in reality don't make a noise and I am so happy that they make it make noise in this film because it's just yeah I, I don't I don't think I want to give any of, any of it away. I don't want you to know that it's coming because it's just, it's so good. Just, I'll talk about it in the spoiler section, don't worry. But, yeah. And, let's see. So, yeah, this movie is 77 and a half minutes without end credits and 81 with them. And, yeah, it abs it never loses there's there's no boring section in the film at all which you know i mentioned in the in my review of the first one there are a number of 80s horror movies that are like otherwise really good but there's you know there's just one or two scenes where it's like okay this this is kind of just filling time isn't it you you were you were scared to tell the studio you know, the movie's not technically quite 90 minutes long, so you, you felt like you had to pad it with something, and just, it never happens in this. Like, I defy you. Tell me, in the comments, tell me what scene you think should have, you know, just doesn't, doesn't do anything at all, and I am, you know, I'll be nice, but I'm 100% I'm certain that I can argue against that. I can tell you why that scene needed to be there and so, right and and yeah let's see I guess it is probably yeah if you give the movie half an hour if by then nothing in it has you know really appealed to you much yeah it's just not for you and that's fine you know honestly I have to wonder I, I don't know any zoomers who've watched this because there is a bit of, like, you know, I, I have to wonder if they even recognize, like, a tape player and a, a watch that isn't digital and just, yeah, some of this stuff. I, I don't know. Um, you know, and certainly the kind of energy you see in this, it was it was uncommon for movies at the time. Maybe, maybe like, action movies and, like, the, the kind of... Some some comedies had the, the that this kind of energy, but horror movies and horror comedies d didn't usually have this much energy. This this kind of propulsive drive throughout. You know, today, yeah, there are a number of movies that have that. And like I said in the at the start of this video, I really don't judge this movie for that. And I do still think it has a lot, like. Yeah, I'll still happily sit down and watch, you know, nobody tied me down and forced me to watch this movie or to do this video. I did this because I love this movie so much. So yeah, the the best elements of this, you know, the, the creativity on display, the dark sense of humor, Bruce Campbell's performance, like he... The man is a ham, you know, he just, it's, it's... He goes so over the top that, like, they have to, you know, they have to raise the, the, the top to, to accommodate. Just, you know, and, and, like, some of this movie is basically a one-man show. He is in the cabin, and there's no one else, and you, you're never like, ah, you know, could they, could they bring in another character? Because it's kind of like, it, it's just... There's not even a lot, like, it's not, like, super dialogue-heavy, obviously. He does speak to himself a little bit, mostly to, you know, convey things that it's, like, so that the audience isn't like, wait, what? what is he doing and why, you know? But just, 
his physical performance, the faces he pulls, the noises he makes, the things he does with his voice, just truly amazing, you know. And, uh, yeah, the worst aspect continues to be the misogyny, which I think overall is a tad less raging here than it was in the first, but there's definitely, it's definitely still an issue, you know, and, and generally was an issue for early Sam Raimi movies, uh, you know. And, uh, yeah, some uh, something I did see some uh, criticize about it, you know, some said th that it, it the movie doesn't offer enough variety. And I, I can't really argue with that. That's the kind of thing that's either going to bother you or not. Um, you know, it, it definitely is, especially if you have already, if you come into this having watched the first one, you might feel like, you know, okay, it's, it's bigger, but it's very, it's, it's, you know, some people feel it's too similar. I don't think so. I think it absolutely adds enough there's stuff in this that you just do not see in the first one. Sure, they would have loved to be able to do it, but, you know, did not have the money. But if, you know, if, if you watch the first one and you're like, I don't need to see that again, even if it's done, even if it's bigger and, and better, and you know, you can skip to the, the third one, the third movie, you know, fills you in on, uh, you know, th th this is one of those franchises where you actually can watch just any one of these and be fine, and I, I'm not sure I know any other horror movie franchise where that's one, the very first Halloween movie, you know, but I'm not sure I would say that any of the sequels completely, 100% stand on their own. For the rest of them, you pretty much do have to have, have what, I suppose... Okay, the Friday the 13th movies also, but I don't know if I would necessarily say that... Th this is one of those cases where you can sit down and watch all five movies and have an amazing time, or you can just watch any of the five and also have a really great time. The, the Friday the 13th movies, I... I'm not sure that I would really point to any one of them and say, you know, just, just watch that. You know, it's... You don't have to watch all of them, but I do not think that it's quite to the... But but yeah, this is a series where each of the films will tell you what you need to know for that one film to work. You don't need to watch any of the others, and I think you'd be missing out. But yeah, if you watch the first one and you don't feel the need to... You know, that... And, and on the other hand, if you, like... If you like the concept of, you know, some some young people go to this cabin, some of them become possessed and start attacking, you know, they're, they're tormenting each other. Yeah, the possessed are tormenting, the non-possessed. If you only want to watch that once, I would say this is the one to go with overall. Or I suppose the, the remake, but if you want the Raimi version, then this is very much that. The, with the remake, they wisely didn't try to emulate, you know, I, I think, I, I, I'll be talking about that when I get to that one, but I'm really, really glad that they didn't just try to, like, do that again, or do that without Sam Raimi writing and directing, because that's just, I, I don't, nobody wants that, nobody wants watered down Sam Raimi, you know, it's, you gotta take it at full strength. Now, the yeah, before the first time I watched this, I was worried that the movie might be dated. It is almost as old as I am, so I obviously did not watch it when it first came out. You know, the, the let's see, when did I, I have it right here. The first time I watched it was 2006, so the movie was almost 20 years old, and, you know, this that was a time of my life where I was watching a lot of current movies, a lot of movies that came out around that time were very dissimilar to this one. And yeah, you know, for, for sure I can imagine, you know, if you are very used to much more recent movies, this one might not appeal as much to you. But yeah, it absolutely was not a problem for me. The thing I was most looking forward to was Raimi really letting loose, and yeah, the movie absolutely delivers See, you know, I, I feel like this is, 
I, I already mentioned, you know, it has this the, the energy of like a, a 12 year old, 13 year old boy. You know, it it feels like the movie that every 12 year old, every stereotypical 12 year old boy would make if given the chance. You know, and see, yes, uh, the trailers do give too much away, but also give you a pretty good idea of what the movie is like, and I do think the trailers are absolutely worth watching. The cover and poster do not give too much away, and they give you a decent idea of what the movie is like. You know, the the perhaps the most prominent, the you know, there, there are multiple covers and posters for it, but the most well-known is probably the one that has this skull, but with very active human eyes you know it, it looks like they yeah it, it looks like a person that had all the the skin and flesh removed from their face but the eyes are still there and look alive you know and yeah that you you pretty quickly you know that's either gonna pull you in or repel you and uh, yeah, the covers and posters are worth looking up on IMDb, and on on Rotten Tomatoes it has an 88% certified fresh on the tomato meter and 89% audience score, and the yeah the average critics rating is 7.50 out of 10. Uh, and of the 83 reviews, only 10 of them are rotten. And the audience score is based on over 100,000 ratings. The average rating is 4.3 out of 5. And let's see. Yes, the, the consensus. Less a continuation than an outright re reimagining. Sam Raimi transforms his horror tale into a comedy of terrors and arguably even improves on the original formula. And on Metacritic, it has a 72 from critics, which is described as generally favorable. And the, let's see, there are 18 critic reviews, 72% positive, 22% mixed, 6% negative. There's only one negative review and... Hmm. Okay, uh, I'll just read aloud. So, one person gave it a 3 out of 10. The effects are just as delirious this time around, but the nightmare poetry has vanished, along with the sense of archetypal purpose and narrative inevitability that held the Jack in the Box original together. I don't... I suppose I can see some of that, but I definitely disagree that the nightmare poetry has vanished. I, I think that's back in full force. And the, the users have given it an 8.2 out of 10. Universal acclaim, 85% positive, 9% mixed, 6% negative. Out of, let's see. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so 205 positive, 21 mixed, and 14 negative ratings. And... Let's see, what, what did the negative ones say? Um, let's see. Yeah, one, one person, yeah, one of the negative ones says the acting is hammy. So, yeah, I mean, you're not wrong, but that's, if you consider that a criticism of this movie, you're not going to like this movie, and that's fine. And yeah, one person says one of the one of the most ridiculous horror movies ever made. Yeah, and that's you know, if yeah, if you think that's bad, you're not gonna like this movie. This movie was not made for you. And there are tons of movies that were. So and on IMDB there are currently six hundred and ninety eight reviews. Yeah. Keeping in mind that everyone who reviewed it did so years after it first came out. You know, people came to IMDb to review it after IMDb became a website. You know, 
the the internet wasn't even like public in 1987. I forget exactly when, like, because the military was using it for a little while. But you know, yeah. Um, so that helps you get an idea of how beloved it has been, at least since the the internet. And yeah, some of the most. Let's see. What are the what is the most recent review? Oh, there's one. There's one from yesterday. So yeah. I am not. Th I'm far from the only person who still loves this movie. If you hide spoilers, there are 567 reviews, and I read the top voted 100, and four of those gave it a one out of ten. No one gave it a two. One person gave it a three. Another person gave it a four. Two people gave it a five. Three gave it a six. Seven gave it a seven. 23 gave it an 8, 25 gave it a 9, and 40, 40 out of 100 of the, the top voted, gave it a perfect score of 10 out of 10. This is a deeply beloved movie. And there are 800, 187 links in the IMDb external reviews section. And let's see, it won one award and was nominated for five, let's see, um, yeah, and the, let's see, user ratings, it has a 7.7 .7 out of 10 uh, overall, uh, based on 177,000 votes, 28.1 gave it an 8. 19.6 gave it a 7, 19.5 gave it a 10, 15.9 gave it a 9, and then we get to the ratings that are so low that I don't really understand how anyone can rate it this low, but whatever. 8.4 gave it a 6, 3.8 gave it a 5, 1.8 gave it a 4, 1.3 gave it a 1. It There were some people who, for this, this movie, was really not their cup of tea. 1% gave it a 3, 0 0.7 it gave it a 2, but yeah. Again, this is very much, it's not for everyone, but it very much found its audience. And, yeah, so so like the first one, you know, they, they use pretty much all the practical effects that would make sense to use. You know, there's there's stuff as simple as, as fake blood and some fairly simple makeup, but there's also, this one has very extensive makeup. You know, a lot of, and, and yeah, a lot of latex you have, you know, how much do I want to give away here? Yeah, you have you have some stop motion. You have the just, yeah, some some very very simple gags, and the the stunt work is also quite strong. They really put some of them through the ringer. Bruce Campbell. Yeah, just national treasure. It's it's unreal how much he'll he'll do to himself for the sake of the you know, there's a there's a saying, pain is temporary, although if you're working with Sam Raimi, maybe not. Film is forever, and this is very much that. Like they just you know, just close your eyes, think of England and and throw yourself into it and it's, yeah. The movie's all the better for it. Now, my version has the following special features, uh, DVD. Uh, one commentary track with Sam Raimi, Bruce Campbell, co-writer Scott Spiegel, and SFX wizard Greg Nicotero. This was before he, Kurtzman, and I cannot believe I'm blanking out. Hold on. I This will not stand. KNB are the... Okay, uh, Wikipedia definitely has it. Hold on. The KNB trio. The, let's see, yes, KNB FX group. You know, Robert Kurtzman, Greg Nicotero, and Howard Berger. You know, KNB derived from the initials of their last names. And yeah, it was founded in 88, so not long after this. And I do believe all three of them did work on this movie together. And yeah, you know, it's... They are they are beloved for a reason. Uh, you know, the, the... Let's see... 
yeah, they they did stuff like Nightmare on Elm Street 5, Halloween 5. Let's see. Right, and they actually did, they, they made an animatronic buffalo uh, cadaver for, or wait, cadaver, yeah, yeah. An animatronic buffalo for Dances with Wolves. And this actually, yeah, the Nicotero set this helped break them out of being known for only gory horror films. And let's see. Yeah, and the. Let's see. Yeah, they worked on Misery. And yeah, they returned for Army of Darkness. That's right. Uh, Reservoir Dogs and yeah, and Kurtzman, you know, helped uh, write uh, from Dust Till Dawn one and yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, throughout the two thousand, they continued their collaboration with Tarantino, working on Kill Bill and other films and. Yeah, they did makeup effects for Land of the Dead and Chronicles of Narnia, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, which was originally going to be completely digital, which is sadly something that started happening around that time. And they, yeah, they've done special makeup effects for The Walking Dead, which has drawn awards and nominations. Yeah, just an unbelievably talented uh, trio. And yeah, to return to the commentary track, the, the you know since it features both Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, it is much more fun to listen to than the two for the first film, where they're separated and thus can't interact, and it and we are all the poorer for it. Those are still great commentary tracks, but just having the two of them, like, pretty much the first thing they do is, like, argue over exactly who filmed the the logo and just you know I th if I recall Bruce starts by saying you know Sam's not gonna tell you this so I'll tell you you know that this was actually shot by Sam and then Sam you know is that not right and Sam is like that is not right and just yeah they're they're so much fun together you can really tell you know they they Went to the same high school. They've been friends ever since. And yeah, the DVD also has the one and a half minute theatrical trailer and a 32 minutes behind the scenes. Very informational. You learn a lot about how they made the movie. And this helps make up for the fact that, like I said, you know, they did not shoot any B roll when making the first movie. And again, I don't blame them for it. You know, let's also keep in mind, this was back when DVDs were not a thing. Like, special features were not a thing. You might shoot, like, some documentary stuff so they could put it on TV and advertise the movie. But, you know, so, so yeah. But it's it's really, really great. Um, they, they talk about so many different things and you get, you know, you see some of the special effects... You know, and and yeah, you you see how they they originally even did it, and just you know, one one of the actors you literally see as the the you know goo stuff it, it covers their face so they can make a, a cast of it. You know, Let's see, yeah, and uh, yeah, I rate this ten horrifying passion projects out of ten. You know, I'm not saying that everything in the movie is perfect. It's just extremely close, and the strength of all of that makes so that, you know, yeah, if you watch this movie ten times, you will eventually be like, oh wait, there's a there's a there's a hole in the in the in that suit, isn't there? Oh, that was actually you know, I I see how they did that, that kind of thing, you know. Uh yeah, the movie absolutely hold up holds up and it is beloved as it should be and yeah so to return to the ranking yeah worst to best but I love them all the first one this one army of darkness the remake and rise I feel this is a series where they just 
each one was better than the last, and they started at a very, very high level. And yeah, the rest of this video video will have spoilers. Uh, let's see, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna start with the notes taken while watching. These are gonna be in chronological order, mostly. And yeah, just really love the intro with the book. Like this is this is one of those things where like there's it's extremely rare for me to look at anything in any movie and be like, every movie should be like this. You know, I I I'm in favor of experimentation. I think that you should do you should try different things with different movies. But I think a strong case could be made that every movie should open with just, you know the book of the dead and you know lands and opens and they you know all the you know it magically flips through a bunch of the pages there from when the seas ran red with blood and it was this blood that inked the book it just amazing just absolutely love it and yeah we see the you know the bridge looks much bigger than the first one but it is you know it's that's Size doesn't matter, it's what you do with it, but yeah, and we see it from the side, which also just makes it hit really hard when we see it later, and like, you know, it's like, it's maybe 30 meters of bridge that is just gone, you know, like, it's it's not that, you know, when you watch the first movie, it's also obvious they're not going to be able to get back that way, you know, they couldn't just like take a running jump or something, but just, yeah, and... Ash is so corny after the dance, you know, just the, you know, sh some champagne. I am a man and you are a woman, last I checked. It's just, I mean, it's just, yeah, so ridiculous. And, yeah, and we get the, the tape, and I love the choice to, to, you know, as the tape is playing, we get the flashback of Professor Noby, Henrietta, Annie, and Ed, you know, going to the, the 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 cave and you know finding the book and this thing and and just it's such a great because like the first time you watch the movie, if you don't know that you're going to see Annie, Ed, and Henrietta again later, and actually even Noby himself, the professor, you know. Yeah, you just think, oh, you know, okay, this is the visual of the, the, you know, but, yeah, later when you see several of them again, you know, exactly, you know, because cause in, the, in the first movie, like, we knew, let's see, I believe that, yeah, the first movie also mentions Henrietta, you know, and, and you know, Noby having to, to kill her. In, you know, because she got possessed, you know, but yeah, we didn't, we didn't know that there were other people on the expedition, but it's like, yeah, sure, why not, you know, it's, it would almost be kind of weird if they didn't, you know, like this, that that's a thing, like you have research partners, you know, so yeah, very, very clever way to get that, let's see... And, you know, apparently some people don't love that it shows that and the plane landing. You know, someone else pointed out it goes by real quick. You know, these are very short scenes. They get to the, the point extremely quickly. And, yeah, you know, Linda comes back and she's like cackling and stumbling towards him. And just, and, you know, they point out in both, com in the commentary track for both this and the first, you know, they literally they can see nothing with those massive uh, lenses completely covering their eyes. There's no like hole where the, where the pupil can see through. So she has no idea where she's going. It's, it's like rehearsal and like people yelling from off screen, you know, no, a little to the left kind of thing, you know, and just, yeah. And yeah, it's it's amazing. I love it. And uh, yeah, the the recap is only seven and a half minutes, and the rest of the movie is basically what happened after the end of the first one because the the POV catches up to Ash, and you know, 
I love that the first one just ends with that and the him and Bruce Campbell howling and and just black screaming, you know. But then you see that like the spirit like picks up Ash and like you know it hits him against a bunch of trees and throws him into some water. It just you know I I imagine this was probably the first new scene that Sam Raimi wrote, knowing that it would enable him to really punish Bruce Campbell for knowing him. But just, yeah, they, they, and, and he's in that, he's submerged in that water for a really uncomfortable amount of time, you know, and then his head comes out and he's, you know, deadite ash and, yeah, and, and just really great the, the thing with, you know, okay, the sun comes up, and then it, it, you know, the possession goes away, which is very clever because, yeah, you know, the first movie, once the, the possession starts, the entire rest of the movie is, you know, this, this one night. At the, at the very, very end of it, you know, it's, it's daytime again, but the, the, or close to it at least. But, but yeah, you know, the, the, so, so to have this, the the idea that the the possession goes away and when when the sun rises which is also you know that's a it's a horror trope you know sunlight banishes the evil kind of thing yeah that is very clever i really appreciate how this builds on the first one and also in the first one they mention you know could there be a trail out of here and they never find it because scotty the dumbass doesn't manage to get past the woods attacking him and then in this one, they're like, oh, yeah, there's a trail, you know, and, and then later that one is destroyed. And I love the, the disappearing fog, you know, the, the, cause it's, it's not difficult to do for like technique, but it's just so like, it looks like it's not like violent or gory, but it's so disturbing to watch. You know, you see the the fog just kind of disappear and and it's like literally like movie magic love they set up the fog machine turned it on and once they had the footage they just you know let's do they let's see did they reverse shoot it or did they reverse the footage I, i'm not sure what they did in 87 but you know today i can imagine you might just Although, for Tenet, I feel like some of it was shot back, which I feel like I heard. Anyway, yeah, you know, it's it's super easy, but it has such a strong impact on the audience. And, yeah, Ash is dispossessed. And the bridge is gone, McCready. And then the sun goes back down. And I love that, like, Ash is in the same shot as the sun going down, and it's this kind of thing that, like, I I can only imagine there must have been, a, like, a lot of movie directors who, you know, who saw that and were like, you can't do that. Like, no one's going to believe. Obviously, the sun is not going down right next to him, but it's the kind of thing, you know, it's the kind of thing you might see in, like, a comic book, where you only have so many pages and panels, you got to make it all count, and, like, Nobody watches the movie and literally thinks, wait, did the sun just go down next to him? Because I'm sorry, but that's not how that works. Everybody understands, you know, oh, Ash saw the sun go down. And, you know, it, it adds this level of, like, menace and, and you know, the... the yeah, it means he has to hurry. You know, if if he just saw it and then it cuts to his reaction, it's just not going to have quite the same impact. And then, you know, in the first movie, the POV also sometimes chases. Here there's a car, ch like, it chases the car as it's driving, you know, and he, it's not just a straight, no, he has to, like, back up and turn the car, and then he has to, you know, just absolutely love it. And then after he reaches the, the the cabin, then it chases him around the entire thing. And every so often, like, Bruce Campbell is like, oh, you know, just like, oh, no, the, the demon has almost caught up to me. Just, yeah. 
And, and, you know, now we know what happens. If it catches up to him, he will be possessed again, which, you know, was obviously horrifying for him. And just, yeah. Um, and I, I love, again, like, when the, the POV can't catch him, it's like, well, fine then. And it, like, stomps outside and, and just sits outside the cabin waiting. By the way, I, th I think I forgot to, to put it in the notes, so I'll say it here. Love when he's, like, looking at the, the cabin, and it's like, join us, and the, the windows are, like, eyes. It's just, yeah, fantastic. And let's see. Yeah, then we, you know, we, we hear that Ed has not talked to the professor for about a week. That's, you know, then he went to the cabin, which, yeah, you know, makes sense. He, you know, he went to the cabin to, to stay there and the, the you know, study the, the pages away from the hustle and bustle of the city. And, you know, he, he unfortunately, you know, he, he got the, he read from the, the pages. He, he brought the, the demons back to life. One of them possessed Henrietta. He wasn't able, you know, he could not bring himself to, you know, d dismember her, so he buried her in the fruit cellar. And, you know, he himself died. We never really find out exactly what happened to, to make, but I guess there's some chance that, like, maybe he... Yeah, there's a there's a lot. I'm I'm not I'm not calling it a plot hole or something, you know, but yeah, uh, and and then you know the the yeah the guy who sold the place to like Scotty, real shady dude. I guess just was he selling it before he even knew that the professor, because the professor didn't like leave or he wouldn't still his spirit wouldn't be by the cabin if he just left yeah I, I don't know exactly how that's supposed to but yeah you know landlords they're pretty terrible and yeah then the, the you know whether you want to say the events of the first movie happened or the events of the recap of this movie happened and yeah we're we're caught up and yeah very clever you know just this this idea of the the I, I really appreciate that they put effort into the timeline. You know, there's a lot of 80s horror movies where it's just like, I don't know, it just happened now, who cares, kind of thing. And, yeah, like, you completely follow how the, the you know, why they're only arriving, why, why the others are only arriving now, even though the professor, you know, left a week, oh, yeah, more than a week ago by this point. And... Let's see. Yeah, and Linda comes back and does a dance, and I appreciate, like, they could literally have just had her still have her head and just do do the dance, but no, like, it's, it's like puppetry and maybe some of it animatronic, it's, you know, just, like, they really gave themselves such a difficult job there, and the movie's all the better. Y yeah, like, uh, or, d yeah, you could maybe have, like, had, like, a, a green cloth covering her face or something, but no, it's, it's puppetry, and she even gets the head back, and it, like, rolls up her arm and lands there, and just amazing stuff, just, and, and it's this great, it's so morbid, because, like, when she was alive, it was wonderful to see her dance. You know, oh, she's so full of life. Wink. She's she's happy. She's, it, you know, it's enthusiasm. It's, you know, and to see it now that she's dead, like, it's, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's such a, such a, just, upsetting thing to watch and the movie even makes it funny you know because it's not just like yeah uh, uh, in addition to the dance itself it is also just yeah it's like a, it's the happy dance you know it's a, it's mocking the happiness that they used to share kind of thing and you know and and yeah and a 
smash with the with the chair and you know he let's see yeah yeah he he like wakes up in the chair and it's like okay phew, nothing actually happened. and then you know the head pops up and like bites the hand and it's like we've seen disembodied heads in other horror movies you know it's a it's a obviously you know it's something that you see it and it's like you don't want to be seeing it it's very upsetting that the head is not supposed to be separated from the body and you know under certain circumstances it can be relatively easy to do like effects wise you know like i mentioned you know green cloth over the the yeah where the head is supposed to be you know that kind of thing but I don't remember a movie before this one where someone like has to fight a disembodied head and it's like it's it's bitten onto to his hand so he's like hitting it against solid objects trying to get it to stop biting him and just yeah really really and it's again the kind of the, like yeah the disembodied head by itself might be scary but him like hitting it against stuff is is funny and yeah he goes for for the chainsaw and just the you know the moment that you hear oh chainsaw oh he's gonna chainsaw the head and then the the fabric you know uncovers the fabric and it's just not there and there's like you almost have time to realize what happened before the the headless corpse comes in wielding a chainsaw you know he fights it he's got this like metal thing pipe I, I don't know hits it and it like starts sawing it's it's through the neck and blood sprays on Bruce Campbell's face it's just and he does manage to get the the head into the vice and then you have like you know first she's like taunting and he's about to attack and then she turns back to herself and she's like but I love you and this whole thing and he's like no and she's like yes <laughs> your love was a lie and just yeah amazing stuff and let's see yeah and he's back in the in the cabin and I really love him talking to the mirror and it's like it's st it's the roided up version of in the first movie where he's like close to the mirror and then he like he's, he's about to touch the mirror and then he plunges his hands into water which is already like creepy and slightly funny but then like Ash reaching out and I don't think we're okay we just got our girlfriend does that sound fine just yeah such a such a great gang and yeah, like in in this movie, the 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 spirits do cause a lot, in, induce a lot of hallucinations, which is not something that the first one has a lot of. Really, I guess the water the water mirror might be the only thing that I feel confident in the first movie was a hallucination. I you know because there's a lot of like blood spraying that it's like okay that how is that happening and like stuff seemingly coming to life. But I think that's just stuff the spirits can do. But like plunging your hands into water when you think you're gonna touch a mirror, that's like you know okay, all the rules have have stopped applying. Which yeah, I th I think that's a little further than what the spirits are able to do. Though clearly their power is vast. But yeah, here like there's a bunch of stuff. He'll suddenly you know stuff will happen. He'll suddenly wake up in the chair. And it is very clever because, yeah, then when you see him shoot, you know, it completely, you know, he shoots and he just barely grazes Bobby Joe. And it's like, you know, it's not good, but you can understand how we ended up there because he thought that it's still the, the spirits. And, yeah, just him fighting the hand is truly epic like this is one of those things where you know him fighting his own hand was homaged in liar liar with jim carrey also delivering an energetic slapstick fight 
against, against his own appendage. The movie Out of Hands is essentially built around the concept and does feature one or two inspired bits that I can imagine Sam Raimi approved of, such as the microwave. And the... just... yeah, like, you know, it's like smacking, you know, breaking plates over his head. And there's a point where he, like, does a full flip and lands on the floor. And, you know, he, like, he's trying to, he, you know, the, he sees the, the, um, the, the stuff moving over his hand that's, like, possessing it. And he's like, okay, uh, put, you know, get, get it under some water. Which, you know, I mean, that is, that makes sense for a lot of, wounds of, of like, you know, get get some clean water on it, you know, and he was bitten, which is, of course, also how his hand, and only his hand, was possessed. And the, the, yeah, I absolutely love when the, let's see, oh, right, and then, yeah, it, it cuts away to, yeah, real quick, it it goes to the the professor's family and the the two Hicks and it is kind of funny with you know how much forty five a hundred bucks and let's see yeah yeah and we're back with the you know once it smashed a lot of plates it's like okay there's one more plate I guess I could oh, hold on. There's a, you know, big-ass, like, meat, meat cleaver or something, I, I forget what it's called, you know, and it, uh, I can't quite reach. Okay. And then it starts, like, using its fingers to, like, drag closer. There are a number of things in this film that fill me with mirth, and one of them is the fact that the possessed hand has its own demonic voice, which is, of course smaller, more high-pitched, on account of it being smaller than a person. You know, this guy... Just absolutely love it. And, like, at one point when it's, like, getting closer to the meat cleaver, it gets a POE shot. <laughs> because at this point, okay, so it has enough of a nervous system, it has a voice, so I guess, I don't know, I guess there must be a little throat in there somehow now. Um, it has eyes, I guess. You know, just, it, it makes no sense. And the fact that it manages to express a lot of personality despite just being a disembodied hand with five fingers, like, you know, once he, you know, yeah, once it's it's cut off and it's running, you know, scurrying across the floor like a small animal or something, you know, it, it gets into the... the uh, what do they call them, Mou mouse hole or whatever, you know, and it's like, oh, so you can't hit me? You know, drumming on the on the floor and, you know, flips off Ash at one point. Just, yeah, really, really, just su such, such good stuff. And, yeah, you know, he, so, so, yeah, jumping back sli slightly, you know, he's, he's sawing off the hand, and and it is also you know in the first one yeah one of one of the possessed bites off its own hand, and you know there's the the hand is like attached to the the dagger and you know stabbing and and this whole thing, and then you know this one well I mean why not push that further you know and and it's not like some of it is actually fairly simple like they they had someone under the floor acting the part of the hand. And that allows for a lot of expression, you know. And just because you can't see the rest of the arm, yeah, it's like, you know, you, you, logically you know that that's, that can't be what you're seeing because disembodied hands don't move. But, you know, for a second there it feels like, oh, wow, I, I guess I am seeing a, a disembodied hand, you know. And the... the Right, another. They also do some really great gags with the with Thing, the disembodied hand, in both of the '90s Adams family movies. Um, but but yeah, you know he he saws it off and it's like running off. Let's see, right, and we we go back to to the, yeah the the people proceeding along the trail and the hick, you know. 
He thought him he thought she just meant them little bags. And he's struggling with the with the rest of them. And yeah, you know, the, the arm has been cut off. And, you know, this is your new home, a bucket and some books on top so it can't you know get get out of there. And the top one is a farewell to arms, which yeah, that's I haven't read that one, but I don't think it's about sawing off your possessed hand. Could be wrong. Maybe it is. And the... Let's see... Yeah, you know, he uses the, the gun on the hand. It's also... It is, it is funny when, like, the hand accidentally steps in the mouse trap. You know, and yeah, he, he like, he's trying to, to shoot it with the gun. And, you know, he shoots a, a big hole and you don't hear you know, any more, more noises from the hand, it's like, oh, you must have gotten it. And especially once you see a little bit of blood pour out, and it's like, oh, phew, finally. And then some more blood, and it's like, was, was there that much blood in the hand? And then it's like, whoosh, you know, massive burst of, of blood right in his face. And then several more. There's one shot where there's like three or four, you know, geysers of, of blood. And... Um, yeah, and and the room starts laughing at him, and I really appreciate like the first. Yeah, it starts with the with the uh, what are they, moose head, I think it might be, you know, and the I believe the second thing we see is like this lamp that's going, you know, it's it's normally supposed to be like this, and it's going like, <laughs> and like. That was apparently like originally, like one of one of the crew members did that as a joke, you know, when they were just like goofing around, because you, you know, you can't constantly be super serious while making a movie, especially this one. And like Sam Raimi was like, I'm gonna put that in the movie, and the other guy's like, Yeah, right. And yeah, it ends up in the movie, and for the entire room laughing scene, which. I just, I appreciate, like, it literally is everything in this room that is la laughing. You know, the, the moose head, which was also there in the first one, but there it didn't move. You know, the, the lamp, the books, the, the bookcase thing, the, the, like, um, I th it does the cell, I think the cellar door is also laughing and just, yeah, really, really great just and and to get all the the sounds of laughter they went around and had you know found anyone working on the film that had a nice distinctive laugh and it absolutely paid off like there's so many and i i like to think that you know when they showed the film to to their friends and family they could be like there that's my laugh and you know that because you've heard me laugh before it's just yeah, you know, cause just just such nice, distinct laugh laughs, and yeah, you know, Ash fires the gun at you know he thinks that it's still like possessed or deadites or something, you know, and I really appreciate it because like we've been put in his mind space, we've seen all the hallucinations he's seen and the the spirits just screwing with him and and yeah, and. The, um, I always forget his name, Jake, you know, Jake rushes in and, and punches him and Bruce has pointed out and I kind of agree, it's a little weirdly shot. It's like, how did Jake get from the door all the way into where Ash is to hit him without Ash? spotting him it's you know it's it's slightly weird i i can imagine it worked better on the page and yeah you know annie comes there expecting to find her parents she sees you know you know ash just clearly just shot bobby joe she sees the chainsaw and the pool of blood around it yeah you know it's a very understandable you know conclusion that he must have gone there crazed and attacked them and yeah ash is put in the basement and you know very very shortly after we realize that henrietta is there 
someone's in my fruit cellar. Someone with a fresh soul. And just, yeah, you know, the, the, the I think it's, is it Ed who says, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe your father never, never made it here, you know, which, yeah, you know, at that point, it is like, I mean, we don't have any evidence yet that he, he got here. We haven't heard from him since he supposedly got here. Maybe he just isn't here. And she's like, but this is his tape recorder. And presses play, and we hear, you know, this thing of, well, he... Uh, what's the word? Uh, yeah, he accidentally summoned the, the Kandarian demons. And, you know, he buried Henrietta whole. And just, yeah really great and and we get that little bit there's a there's one shot where ash is like clearly listening to to the tape recorder which is you know it's great that that's there because that you know he's not like completely you know he he doesn't want henrietta to be down there but once he hears it on the tape he he realizes what's going on and yeah so he he manages to get back up the stairs despite henrietta and and she has another great like just slow stumble towards him and you know someone grabs his face and pulls him and it's one of the you know yeah one of the non-possessed and let's see then we have the yeah the, the you know the the yeah Henrietta reaches it and I think is that when the face morphs there I guess maybe there's more than one face morph. Great job on that, and some really horrifying faces. And you know, yeah, the the face is like stuck in the the cellar door, and so they're like jumping on top of it, and one of the eyes pops out and just flies through the air and like into her mouth, and she accidentally swallows. You know, it, Bobby Joe accidentally swallows the eye, and it's such a great like that's apparently uh, Three Stooges gag, though in that one it's like. Um, uh, uh, nut, I think, some, some kind of nut that, you know, one of the others throws in their mouth, and, uh, you know, to have it with an eyeball is like, oh my god, you know, and, you know, it's the thing, like, there's one point where they literally just attached the eye to the front so that they could have, like, it's, I guess it's not quite a point of view shot, although maybe Henrietta can still see through the eye, no, it's not a point of view shot, because you do see the eye, but, you know, there's a shot as it's getting closer and closer to, to her. And the part where it goes into her mouth, like literally what they did was do it in reverse. You know, at the start of the take, the, the eye is, you know, just barely inside her mouth. And they pull it out and rewind it. And it looks like it's flying into and And you don't pick that up the first time you watch it. So it has a really strong effect. And... It takes the weight of two men on top of the cellar door to, to weigh it down, you know. And again, we have this thing of, like, you know, at first it, it hits several times. And then there's the one hit. Like, and then it seems to just be, you know. And then we have Henrietta singing. And, like, Annie is like, really, oh, oh my god, that's mom, you know, and, you know, I remember, you know, I thought it was odd that it was snowing because it was September, and it just, yeah. And, yeah, and, and I think, yeah, and Annie's like, that thing in the cellar is not my mother, and, and, you know, we expect there to be a conversation, or maybe for, for, like, a shot of Henrietta, but then Ed has turned in the meanwhile... And I really appreciate that they gave him multiple sets of teeth. Like, you could understand if they just made, oh, you know, big mouth, big teeth. He has several rows of teeth, which, again, the human brain, the, 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 our lizard brain hates that. That's like, nope, not, nope, get it away from me. I don't want it. Please stop, you know. And let's see. Um, oh, right, and, uh, yeah, um, you know, obviously part of, you know, yeah, they, when writing it, they wanted Ash to end up in the cellar with Henrietta, that's why the abuse the spirits dish out on Ash ends just before the others arrive, you know, I'm not saying it's bad writing, obviously it's completely in character for the spirits to do this, they're always toying with their victims, 
Um, let's see, but but yeah, the the um, uh, and yeah, also having it be Henrietta, you know, that was also, you know, I I could maybe understand why some people, if you know, if you try watching both of these movies right after one another, like. I've done that and had a great time, but for some people it's going to be like, oh, so there's another person in the cellar. But I do really appreciate the the fact that, like, because it really, it does, to me and to many others, feel distinct enough just going from this thing of, you know, the first one, one of them gets possessed, the others manage to get her into the cellar, and she's, like, trying to get out and, you know, t taunting them from the cellar and such. And then in this one, you know, a human being is is forced into the base, in, into the cellar, and and tries to get out. And someone was buried down there and like rises, which is also just like, you know, um, generally when human beings bury our dead, we don't want the dead coming back to life and rising from their grave. That is something that is deeply like it just. Ugh, ah, don't do that. Never do that. Please make it stop, kind of thing. So just yeah, it's it's a great way to start. And and yeah, for the rest of the movie, every so often, Henrietta will, you know, try to get out of the cell or she'll say something or some kind of yeah. And I really appreciate like Evil Ed like manages to you know he that's another thing. He grabs Bobby Joe's hair and manages to, like, yank off a chunk of it. You know, just, again, that's really not, you know, no young person wants to lose that much hair all at once. You know, and then into the mouth and swallows it. And that was apparently, you know, they didn't actually make the actor swallow hair. Although knowing Sam Raimi's extreme torture of his actors he I guess there's some chance it, it was brought up and turned down but no they they the head itself the the fake head the the mask thing you know allowed for you know yeah getting getting the hair all the way in and doing like a swallowing motion and yeah you know Jake can see from the window the trance just gone and I really appreciate, you know, it gets real quiet, which, you know, in the first movie as well, sometimes it would get real quiet, and then there'd be something funny or, and or scary. And here, like, the noises that come after it's been quiet, and I love the couple of shots where, like, again, you know, in each of these movies, with, with Ash, you know, Bruce Campbell does, like, the sudden, you know, sudden face turn or, you know wild movement of but to see like i think one of the shots has like three or four yeah one of the shots has like four people in it and all of them are looking at, at where the noise came from just amazing and yeah they're like you know there's something here and you know the door opens slightly and i, th I th it's maybe bobby joe someone is like it's in there no shit, Sherlock. What was your first fucking clue? It just, yeah. And you know, they they managed to to get in there, and we have the ghost of the professor, who explains, you know, the the missing pages are are the key. And you know, you have the you know, Jake, you're holding my hand too tight, baby. I ain't holding your hand. Whose hand is she holding? You know, love that haunting reference. And, you know, looks at the hand, and it's the disembodied hand that's like... And it's such a, like... In its little, little possessed Kandarian demon hand brain, it's like, you know what would totally screw with these guys? If I hold her hand really tightly, you know, because, like, it's not actually hurting her. Like, it's, it's uncomfortable to be clear, but it's not like, there's so much it could be doing that, you know, later it stabs Annie in the back with the with the dagger, you know, so clearly it's capable of doing much worse, but it's just doing that to mess with them, you know, and, and that's, yeah. And 
yeah, just really, really great bit. And yeah, the pages set up the rest of the film, and and it's it's it is very clever. You know, this thing of because because like in the first one, the the destruction of the book appears to resolve it, but there are still, you know, the the ah, what's the word? You do still have the the spirits attack Ash at the end, you know. But then here, it's like, ah, but, you know, which, and that's the thing, apparently some people watched this movie and thought the book was still around, you know, even, as, I'm almost certain that the idea with this movie is the book was destroyed, we just didn't see it, you know, because it's only the missing pages that were, that are used at, at the end. Um, but, but yeah, you know, you have the, ah, uh, what's the word, the, the, um, you have the, the the book is destroyed in the first one that seems to resolve it. So here, yeah, the missing pages could maybe completely resolve it because the the spirits are still around. You know what it resolves are the people who were already possessed, but that's not enough. You know, so yeah, very nicely done with with that. And yeah, you know, just as soon as the pages have been used to set up the rest of the film. They are tossed into the cellar, and this is something I believe it's the I believe it's Scott Spiegel on the, on the commentary track says. I wish I wish Jake was standing right next to the cellar instead of picking them up, taking several steps, and then throwing them in the cellar. Because at that point, it really is like, oh my god, you are just trying to win the biggest dumbass award, are you not, Jake? Because that's like you were literally you were there. You know, you heard the ghost say, the, the, you know, the missing pages are the key. And you still throw them into the, just, yeah. And, and I really appreciate, you know, and, and yeah, uh, Jake gets them all the way out, you know, threatening with the gun, gets them out there to look for Bobby Joe, and the, the POV comes closer and closer, and we're like, it's gonna t attack Jake, and it, it seemingly gets there, and we're like, oh, I guess it didn't attack Jake. And then, you know, possessed Ash pops into frame, and it's, it's yeah, very, very clever, because just, yeah. And, let's see, yeah, and, and Annie manages to, to get back, and she finds the dagger, and, you know, thinking that that's Ash by the door, she stabs and it turns out to be Jake. And then she's like trying to close the door, but Jake is in the way, so she just hits him with the door several times. And she's like starting to drag him, and she gets him part of the way, and then tries to close the door, and smacks another part of his body with the door, and just, yeah. You know, and, and at this point, like, we do really, really hate Jake, so, like, seeing him, you know stabbed and hit multiple times with the door and dragged and and just you know and and not long after you know just torn apart in the cellar to the point where a lot of blood sprays out you know yeah he's you know we really hate him so seeing that is not the worst thing in the world as long as it's happening to a fictional character of course and let's see. Yeah, and, and just yeah, Henrietta grabbing him and pulling him in and the you know, she Annie grabs the legs and, and the blood spreads just yeah, really, really nicely done. And the necklace manages to bring back Ash and Annie attacks him with the axe because she thinks that he's still possessed, because he was like seconds ago, you know. And yeah, it is kind of funny that like you know, he's, he comes all the way back, and he, like, sits, it's like, okay, we're okay, we're gonna, you know, and then the axe hits right next to him, you know, and he's like, okay, I'm okay, I'm back. And we think, okay, that's, you know, and then she attacks again, it's like, <laughs> and, yeah, and she points out, you know, okay, you're back, but for how long? And... Yeah, you know, they have to get the pages back from the cellar. 
let's go carve ourselves carve ourselves a witch and we get the shot of Henrietta <laughs> you know just yeah I I gotta say the, the when I look at Ted Raimi's face the first thing that pops into my head is always going to be Joxer you know I've spent a lot of hours of my life watching Xena so seeing him as possessed Henrietta you know I realize he played that role before you know, but yeah, it's it's very very it's wild to me, and yeah, we get the excellent montage that you know where the the saw goes in place of the hand, and you know he has the the thing to to start it with, you know, so he can just yank with his his face to to start it, and you know the the holster for the gun, groovy. And, yeah, the, you know, he goes into the cellar to get the pages, which magically stick together later when he throws them all at the, you know, into Annie's hand later, which they call out in the commentary track also. And you hear this noise that sounds like a hissing, so we think, oh, that's where Henrietta is, and it turns out to just be a, a pipe. And we find what I'm guessing is supposed to be Professor Nobi's skeleton. And let's see. We, and, and yeah, again, very, very, you know, lots of movies have skeletons. Lots of horror movies have skeletons. But it just, the fact that it like falls onto Ash is like, ah, you know, get it away from me. And, you know, we, we are again, like, like with near the end of the first movie, it is like a haunted house where stuff, like, comes out at you and, and all this, just, yeah. And, yeah, Henrietta fighting Ash and Annie is is great and, like, floating up in the air and, call, and, and yes, if you look at, you know, and there are times where you can't, there's at least a second or two where you can see, like, the, the, um, there's a there's a crack in the latex suit, you know, and there's one shot where like sweat pours out of Ted Raimi's ear and just yeah, because they worked really really hard, worked up a sweat and just yeah, and yeah the the morphing head really really excellently done, and Ash manages to to saw off several limbs like swinging the chainsaw just yeah, and. Yeah, you know, fires the gun, spins it on his finger, and holsters it behind it. You know, such a great... It is like, you know, taking the, the typical Western anti-hero thing and just, you know, on steroids. There it'll, you know, often be like a, a six-shooter, a handgun, you know. But, yeah, spin on the finger, holster it after use. And... Yeah, the evil in flesh, really great creature design, really, really just, again, like, you just, ugh, get, it, get it away from me. And they, they do a great, like, lens effect also to, to make it warp, really, really good. That, they also do something on the, the ghost of Professor Nobi, great stuff, really helps sell it. Like, God, imagine if it was just, like, a floating disembodied head. We've seen that before, but this kind of extra, just, yeah. The extra effort really, really does a lot, and you know Annie is about to finish the the um, the the incantation, and then you know suddenly she stops, and the the hand stabbed her with the dagger, and it's such a great you know in in the review I mentioned you know some things have multiple payoffs you know there are multiple payoffs to Henrietta, multiple payoffs to the hand because it is this thing like when you see Ash shoot it. You know, we don't actually see it hit. That's the thing. We think that it was hit because it, like, I forget if it makes a wounded noise, but it certainly stops making noise. And then some blood pours out. So we think, ah, the hand is done. He shot it. He killed it. And then later, you know, and, and then once the, the blood starts spraying out, we're too distracted to stop and think, oh, I guess the hand is still alive. So the next time we see it, which I think, I think the next time we see it is, you know, I ain't holding your hand. You know, it's like, oh, right, it never died because the blood, you know, so the just, yeah, really, really nicely done. And the, let's see, yeah, just, you know, it's it's still around. We just don't see it for a while. 
and and Ash is almost eaten by the the giant thing. You know, makes a hand out of a tree, and like pulling him closer to the open mouth, and that's a big no. Nope, do not need to see a living human being be eaten by a gigantic mouth. That is not something I need inside my brain, you know. And I do, I, I have heard that something like that also appears. Like, I believe today you have horror movies where you full-on see a, a character played by a human actor be, you know, eaten, obviously, special effect, you know. They're not going to do that in reality, obviously. But, you know, that's, yeah, really, really nicely done. Just... The, they keep thinking of these things that really get to us, that really get under our skin. And, yeah, you know, she manages to finish the incantation and open the portal. And, you know, the car is also dragged into the past, which, you know, of course it is. How else would Sam Raimi possibly be able to put it in the past? You know, it's not like he ever has put the car in a movie set before Cars. You know, he did, fair enough, he did, like, disguise it in The Quick and the Dead, but that is still wild to me that he actually, he was so determined to put his, that that one car in every movie of his that, yeah. And, yeah, you know, like, it it seems like, oh, everything's, everything's good. The, the evil was, you know, driven back, you know, removed from the, this earth, and, and this, you know, and, and Ash is like, by God, and we really, yeah, it seems like, okay, I, you know, first one certainly didn't, but I guess the second movie's got a happy ending, as, you know, and then, like, we see the portal is still open, and it starts pulling, you know, it pulls, like, the door open or something, you know, and he's, he's getting dragged back into it, it's like, how do we make it stop? And... Yeah, you know, the, the, yeah, he lands, and, you know, for a second, it's like, okay, what exactly, you know, and then the knights step into view is this POV shot of him from below, and we just see, like, eight knights above him, and just, and, you know, they're about to kill him thinking he's a deadite, which, yeah, the, you know, if, the, if people back then saw something that they didn't know, they were gonna think, oh, it's, it's evil, you know, and, Today, if you're conservative, that's also your reaction. But yeah, the and and he manages to kill the the flying deadite, which is also just a great because it's you know immediately you realize oh you know this is back when the deadites were you know it it's right away you get the sense that it's going to be bigger you know it's a it's a great tease for Army of Darkness. We really do get the sense that the the deadites were had a much bigger presence in back back then you know and the you know at the start of the movie they did say the book disappeared in 1300 AD that's when the the ending of this and the movie army of darkness is set so very very clever and you know you have the thing with you know oh there was this guy prophesied to be the the savior and, yeah, at the end of the movie, you realize that's Ash. And, you know, and, and the first time you see it in the movie, it goes by quickly enough that you don't sit and think, ah, I now I know how it ends. It's going to end with him being, you know, doing time travel. But, yeah, you know, he shoots the, the dead eye, you know, blowing up the, the head, and they're like, the, the chosen one, hail! And the, the guy who, like, opens, you know, in case you feel like you've seen that face before, that is Sam Raimi, you know, un uncovering his face and saying, he is the chosen one, hail, you know, and then they all start hailing. And the commentary track, they're also like, I know that walk. That night is actually, you know, they're going over who plays which of the, of the knights, which was, of course, a, a good way to sneak a crew member on camera because... They don't have to act. They just have to, like, walk and stand a little bit. That's not the... the those are some of the easier ways. It's a, very simple acting, you know. It's harder with the face and the voice and such. You know, I'm not saying... To be clear, there are definitely some very talented actors who only use the body language. And, yeah, like the first film, this one ends with 
ash screaming and just yeah i really i love that like because yeah the first one ends with the camera the pov shot attacking ash and him screaming because of him being attacked and this one the camera's pulling away from him and all the knights are like yeah we're number one we're gonna win this one you know finally and he's like ah oh, i don't want to you know <laughs> He didn't want to go back in time, you know, so just, yeah, very, very, just such a, such a great way. And it was also, you know, he was like, okay, I'm telling you next time I'm going to make Army of Darkness. You know, the third movie is definitely going to be the one with, you know, and it is like, uh, I think I will talk about it in the, yeah, when I talk about Army of Darkness, and I did also, I did talk about it a little bit in my video for Evil Dead Rise, so maybe, we'll, we'll see if I talk about it again. But, yeah, Sam Raimi had other ideas, you know. I, I feel bad that people think of this series and it's like, oh, he made the same movie twice. He didn't mean to. He was hoping to make Army of Darkness as the second film, but, the you know, the budget was going to be, you know, a, a problem, He you know. It's it's you can do a lot with a fairly limited budget if all you need is you know this this cabin and small cast of characters and and you know effects and such. For this one, they they you know it was it was much more money than than the first, but you know actually making Army of Darkness was going to take a pretty significant amount of money. Even yeah, so. Uh, that is it for this section, which brings us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. So, uh, yeah, the movie, as mentioned earlier, is very misogynistic. It is true there is a lot of violence towards men as well, but violence against women in media can normalize violence against women in real life in a way that just is not the same when it comes to depictions of violence against men. There are cases where women have been very severely punished, including by the quote-unquote justice system, for fighting back when men have committed a lot of violence against a woman, and the woman finally tries to defend herself, even if she doesn't hurt him. There's one case where a woman, Marissa Alexander, clearly fired the gun, careful not to injure the man, but was punished as if she had tried to kill him, sentenced to 20 years, took the jury 12 minutes to make the decision. The defense tried invoking the stand your ground law, which has gotten men off killing, but because she was a woman and black, people wanted her to suffer. Ultimately, there was a movement that succeeded in making the penalty less severe, but there's countless other cases where women have been punished for daring to not simply take whatever violence a man wanted to dish out. Also, every single time there's a prominent case of a man physically abusing a woman, even when there's video evidence, even when it's really clear it's the man doing something wrong, you have a lot of misogynists on social media, some are even willing to show their face, attach their real name to it, defending the man. And I hate to say it, but there is a segment of the horror movie fan community that enjoy watching women be heard, at least in fiction. And I don't mean feeling a cathartic thrill of seeing violence in fiction. I mean, literally, they want to see women get hurt. In. And fiction is a way for them to do that without causing real-life violence or looking for videos of real-life violence. This movie does not have overt tree rape, but when Bobby Joe is attacked by the forest, it is coded as rape the way that it... Yeah, and, and uh, you know, the, the, um, you have the, um, let's see, the, the attacks uh, against Henrietta and, you know, when, when Annie, yeah, and, and Linda, and when Annie, you know, like, is attacking Ash after he's no longer possessed, you know, that is very much like, saying, oh, you know, these, these women, the just, you know, irrational kind of thing. So, which is, you know, sadly, you know, it does still happen today, and it used to be even worse. You know, when, when a woman does not agree to accept the abuse that men dish out upon her, she's labeled as irrational. So, that is it for this one. So, yeah, in one week, Army of Darkness, and in two weeks, the Evil Dead remake. Uh, let me know in the comments what is your favorite scene from this one. What, wh which of the creature designs do you think is best? So, 
you know, to me, it's probably the the evil in flesh at the very end that's trying to eat Ash and such. But, you know, I don't want to discount stuff like Henrietta, especially the, you know, the, the head that loses an eye. And evil Ed's face with many rows of teeth and just, yeah. If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists. I suggested video for you watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. I also do a weekly video talking about the current Disney Plus MCU series, which these days is Loki. The uh, um, horror show uh, on Disney Plus, which these days is Blood Curse. I try to do daily, but it ends up not being every single day a video on the most recent episode. I've gotten personally gotten around watching of a Marvel TV show other than Netflix, those I did already finish. Currently, I am about halfway through uh, Agents of Season 2 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And recently, the Review and Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if more of it is like this, your luck. You can check out my back catalog, as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. Stay groovy.